Good afternoon. My name is Kelsey Brown Corcoran. I'm a partner in the Supreme Court and appellate practice at Oric, Harrington, and Sutcliffe, and a longtime member of ACS, dating back over a decade to when I was a student at the University of Chicago Law School. I first became involved with ACS because I believe in its mission. Like ACS, I believe that law should be a force to improve the lives of all people, and it is a privilege to support ACS in its efforts to make that happen. Over the years, I've also developed a deep appreciation for everything my ACS membership has given me, including countless professional development opportunities and a fantastic network of colleagues and friends. At this particular moment, I am deeply grateful to ACS for the opportunity to introduce our final featured speakers of the convention, two extraordinary jurists. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's biography is well known. Before her, uh, I'm going I'm to give a little bit of it anyway. Uh, uh, before her appointment to the U.S. Supreme Court, she served on the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, for the D.C. Circuit, and prior to becoming a judge, she was a law professor at Rutgers and Columbia University. Over her decades of service, Justice Ginsburg has been an unwavering advocate for women, both on the bench and as one of the founders of the Women's Rights Project for the ACLU, where she served as general counsel and on the National Board of Directors for nearly a decade. I had the extraordinary honor of clerking for Justice Ginsburg, which was as amazing and life-changing an experience as you would expect. Among my fondest memories of that year were the champagne and cupcake birthday parties that the justice would host for each of her clerks and secretaries. And so, fully aware of just how crazy it is to have a birthday party with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, <laughs> uh, my co-clerks and I would plan for days in advance, trying to come up with the perfect list of questions to ask her. And we did pretty well. We heard amazing stories about her summers in Sweden, where she was learning and writing about Swedish civil procedure. Uh, we heard about her first Supreme Court argument, uh, her confirmation hearings, and her beloved husband, Marty, uh, a distinguished tax attorney and uh, chef supreme whose love and support for the justice uh, is legendary. If Tumblr had existed before he passed away, there's no doubt that he would have started the notorious RBG blog himself. <laughs> no. Uh, but, but even so, when the clerkship ended, I had this deep sense of remorse when I thought about all the questions we didn't get to ask and all the stories we didn't get to hear. So this next hour is a dream come true for me. It's one more chance to hear about the incredible life and career of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, facilitated by the best interlocutor I can imagine, California Supreme Court Justice Goodwin Liu. Like Justice Ginsburg, Justice Liu was a law professor before joining the bench. He's a widely published expert in constitutional law, uh, education policy, and the Supreme Court. Uh, he was a popular and acclaimed teacher, winning the uh, UC Berkeley Law's Distinguished Teaching Award, and he eventually became the Associate Dean. And as many of you know, he was also on the Board of Directors for ACS for a number of years. Yeah. But long before all of that, Justice Liu was a law clerk, uh, first for uh, Judge David Tatel on the DC Circuit, a longtime friend of ACS for whom I also clerked, uh, and then for Justice Ginsburg. So he is perfect for this job because I know that he too has a long list of questions left over from the Chamber's birthday parties, and I am so excited to listen in as he asks them. Please join me in welcoming Justice Goodwin Liu and Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you all for being here on a Saturday afternoon, and most especially thank you to Justice Ginsburg. Uh, it's obviously a busy time at the court, as <laughs> June often is. Uh, so thank you for spending a few minutes with us here. Uh, so um, you're now finishing your 22nd term on the Supreme Court. A lot of people have noticed that in recent years you've had quite a substantial public presence uh, you have a huge fan base everywhere you go. Um, people call you a rock star, uh, an icon. There's an opera 
uh, about you and Justice Scalia. On the first <laughs> um, there's a emoticon uh, that <laughs> looks like you. There are the t-shirts um, with the notorious RBG meme. Uh, some of them also say, I love RBG, and then there's my personal favorite, which is, you can't spell truth without Ruth. <laughs> and then there are even the young women who have tattoos uh, of your likeness. <laughs> now, that, that's love. I mean, that... <laughs> That's real. I mean, you know, all of this, I think, is pretty unusual for a Supreme Court justice. I think, you know, Justice, justice Scalia gets out a lot, too, but I don't think there's anyone with a Justice Scalia tattoo, um, not even at the Federalist Society. So I guess I just want to start by asking you, um, how did this happen? It is, it's amazing and to think of me an icon at 82. <laughs> I, I, I attribute it all to an NYU law student who started a Tumblr, the notorious RBG. <laughs> in, in, at first, I didn't know quite what to make of this because I didn't even know who notorious B.I.G. was. <laughs> and then my law clerks explained to me, when well, you two have something in common, you, you, you were both born and bred in Brooklyn, New York. So, <laughs> Scalia Ginsburg, the opera. I should explain right away a criticism a number of my feminist friends have raised. Ginsburg comes before Scalia alphabetically, so why is it Scalia Ginsburg? <laughs> And the answer, good one, I'm sure you know, how important seniority is in our workplace. And I'm so, getting a sense of that. Yeah. <laughs> so Scalia was appointed some years before Ginsburg, so the opera is Scalia Ginsburg. So there's also going to be a, a biography of you in, in the near future uh, called The Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, by the MSNBC reporter Erin Carmen, and then... There's also a biopic scheduled uh, called On the Basis of Sex with Natalie Portman, starring as you. Um, are, you uh, are you in on these projects? Um, <laughs> do you know much about them? Are you, are you a cooperative conspirator? Or? Well, I can't claim credit for Notorious RBG, but I like it, and so do my grandchildren. <laughs> and, on the basis of sex, is that what the biopic is called? This is how it began. I have a nephew, uh, the son of my husband's sister, who is a script writer. And he asked if he could write a script about a case in which Marty and I were involved in 1971. And I said, yes, if you would like to spend your time doing that. Um, <laughs> The case is interesting because it was the case that I hope would be paired with Reed v. Reed as the turning point case in the Supreme Court. The case was Charles E. Moritz, the Commissioner of Internal Revenue. Charles E. Moritz was a man who took good care of his mother, though she was 93 at the time. We argued the case in the Tenth Circuit. This was his story. There was, in those days, a babysitter's deduction available to any woman or widowed or divorced man. The babysitter deduction covered elder care as well. Charles E. Morris didn't get the deduction because he was a never married man and he'd been left out. So he appeared pro se in the tax court and he, his brief was the soul of simplicity. It was simply, if I were a dutiful daughter, I would get this deduction. I'm a dutiful son. It makes no sense. So one day, Marty came 
into a room where I was working away on something I was writing and said, Ruth, read this. And I turned to him and said, Marty, that's a tax advance sheet. You know I don't read tax cases. <laughs> and he said, read this one. And it told the story of Charles E. Morris. And we said, let's take it. And Marty would write the tax part, and I would write the constitutional law part. So a part of this is about the case and about our argument in the Tenth Circuit in Denver. And then... It includes the ACLU and some women who were saying the same things that I was saying in the 70s, but at a time when no one was prepared to listen. So Dorothy Kenyon has a, has a role in this. I think it will go into production in the beginning of 2016, and maybe by the end of the year it will be, it will be out. Natalie Portman came to talk to me about this, and we had a very good conversation. And one thing interesting that she insisted on, it held up the project for a while. She said, I want the director to be a woman. A woman. There are not enough women in this industry. There are many talented out there. And now that they, they do have a, a woman director. Well, we, we look forward to it. Um, you, you mentioned Marty. He's been mentioned many times. Um, let, me, let me take you back a little bit. Um, for many years, I think, you've, you've been described as shy and reserved, uh, especially compared to your gregarious and very loving husband, Marty, who was, as Kelsey said, an outstanding chef and always very quick with a joke. Um, some people called him a serial wisecracker. Um, <laughs> But um, first of all, do you think Marty would be surprised at your celebrity uh, today? I think he would be delighted. He was always my biggest booster. The audience just saw a picture of you and Marty in, in Fort Sill, which was not long after um, you were married. Um, you met Marty during your first year of college at Cornell, is that right? And you've... You've said in the past that he was the first boy you ever dated who cared that you had a brain. Yes. I like that. Um, and, and the two of you had two kids, um, Jane and James, and you also had a two-career marriage. Um, two lawyers, in fact, which was unusual uh, at the time. Can you describe a little bit about that period and uh, what kind of social pressures you faced with respect to your marriage, your family life, and your career? There was a big change in the climate of the time from my first child, Jane, born in 1955, and second one, James, in 1965. When Jane was small, there were very few women who worked outside the home. By the time Jane, James was born, it wasn't unusual to have a, a two-earner family. Um, what was it like? Well, it's, it's hard for today's students to imagine what the world was like for women not all that long ago. I think when I started law teaching in 1963, maybe 3% of the lawyers in America were women. Uh, there was no Title VII when I graduated from law school, so employers were upfront that they didn't want any lady lawyers, or they had a woman once and she was dreadful. How many men did, did they have? Uh, I'll tell you Sandra Day O'Connor's story. She graduated from law school, top of her class in Stanford. She was a few years ahead of me. She couldn't get any job, so she volunteered to work for a county attorney and said, if you think I'm good enough, after four months, you can put me on the payroll. That's how she got her job. My first job was as a district court, federal district court law clerk. How did I get that job? Well, Jerry Gunther, who later went off to Stanford but was at Columbia Law School at the time, was in charge of clerkships. He called every judge on the Second Circuit, every judge in the Eastern District and the Southern District of New York. 
the answer was, well, we might take a chance on a woman, but we can't risk a mother. Her daughter is four years old. So Jerry called Judge Edmund Palmieri, who always took his clerks from Columbia Law School. And the judge explained, well, her record is good, but sometimes we work on Saturdays, even on a Sunday. And how could I count on her? And Jerry said, give her a chance. And if she doesn't work out, then there's a young man in her class who will leave his Wall Street law firm and finish up the clerkship. So that's the carrot. Then there was a stick. <laughs> and the stick was, if you don't give her a chance, I will never recommend another Columbia law student to you. Well, armed with that, I got the job, and like, <laughs> and all the women of my generation, you, you, when you got the job, you did it as well, probably better than anyone else. So the second job was, wasn't hard, but opening that first door was powerfully difficult. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, you've, you have had many clerks uh, yourself who were parents um, at the time, is that right? Um, is that unusual uh, at the court today, do you think? Not, not today. No, I've had a number of clerks with two children. The first law clerk I hired who was the primary custodian of his children was a man. This was uh, David Post, who's now teaching at Temple Law School. He, in his application, he explained that he was going to Georgetown at night because his wife was an economist. Uh, I think for the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank. And so she had a full-time day job. He took care of the children d during the day. So that, I mean, that's my dream for the world, that fathers should care about children as much as mothers. Then there was something else about David Post that made him irresistible. His writing sample was not his draft of his law review note or his moot court brief. It was his first year writing, uh, writing section um, essay, and it was on the theory of contract as played out in Wagner's ring cycle. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, <laughs> that's actually a good segue um, to <laughs> the next question. Uh, you've seen uh, feminism change uh, and go through many transformations from the time you were, um, but since the time you co-founded the ACLU Women's Rights Project in 1972, four decades later to today. And because of the work you did there, we now have the elimination of most overt forms of gender discrimination. Um, from your vantage point, what do you think are the most pressing challenges left now for um, gender equality? First, Goodwin, I should say I don't think the meaning of feminism has changed. It has always been that girls should have the same opportunity to dream, to aspire, and achieve to do whatever their God-given talents enable them to do as boys. Uh, and that there should be no place where there isn't a welcome mat for women. People misunderstand what feminism is. I know in some quarters it's called the F word. Uh, but that's what it's all about, is that women and men working together should help make the society a better place than it is now. And the current, current challenges? Well, as you said, Goodwin, all of the overt gender classifications are almost to all. There are a couple that the Supreme Court has left standing, and that's unfortunate. But for the most part, 
the statute books that were once riddled with overt sex-based classification, in the, in the decade of the 70s, almost all of them were gone. And it was a combination of legislative change plus litigation to push that, that change along. What's left and is harder to get at is what I call unconscious bias. Sometimes it's a device that works to overcome unconscious bias. And my example of that is the symphony orchestra. When I was growing up, you never saw a woman except playing the harp. Someone had the bright idea of dropping a curtain so the people who were conducting the audition didn't know if it was a woman or a man. And with that simple change, the drop curtain, almost overnight, women started to show up in symphony orchestras in numbers. I was telling this story uh, last summer at, Ca at the Castleton Festival, where Scalia Ginsburg will open, and a young violinist said to me, but you left one thing out. Not only do we, we audition behind a curtain, but we audition shoeless. Yeah. <laughs> well, that device uh, can't be duplicated in every area. But it's, it's hard to get at. My favorite case in that line was a Title VII case from the 70s. The lawyer was my colleague at Columbia, Harriet Rabb. It was against AT&T for not promoting women to middle management jobs. There were several criteria. The women did at least as well as the men up to the last test, and that was called the total person test. It consisted of an interviewer meeting the candidate, candidate and then doing an evaluation women flunked disproportionately at that stage. And why? Because the person conducting the interview was generally a, a white male. And anyone who was different made the interviewer feel slightly uncomfortable. He looked at a person who looked like him, he was comfortable. But with a member of a minority group of women, they were strangers. And it wasn't a case of, I'm, a, I'm deliberately I'm setting out to avoid promoting women. It wasn't that at all. It was this unconscious bias that, that operated. You know, so you now sit on a court that has three women on it. Uh, I actually sit on a court that has a majority of women on it, including a woman as Chief Justice. Um, do you think that the law would be much different if there were, say, four or five women on the U.S. Supreme Court? I think it's pretty good that we have three now. It, 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 three makes a big difference because we're all over the bench. And I sit toward the middle because I've been around so long. <laughs> uh, Justice Kagan is at my left. Justice Sotomayor is at my right. And if any of you have come to watch the show at the court, you know that my newest colleagues are not shrinking violets. <laughs> very active in questioning. I've often quoted what Jean Coyne from the Minnesota Supreme Court has said, that in the end of the day, a wise old man and a wise old woman will reach the same judgment. And yet there are some cases that, at least I think, would have come out the other way if there were uh, five women or more. And one of them is Lily Ledbetter's case. Every woman understood Lily's problem. Another is uh, the Carhartt case, the pa partial birth abortion case. Another of the two cases involving children whose parents were not married and become, they could become citizens if their mother was a U.S. citizen, not if the father. The, the Supreme Court was wrong about that twice. So there are, there are cases where I think it's fair to predict 
that the, re the result would have been different. But for the most part, in the years that, that David Souter and I served on the court together, we voted more alike than any two other justices, even more than Justice Thomas and Justice Scalia. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to the Souter Ginsburg opera. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Well, um, a couple months ago, you appeared on Time Magazine's uh, 100 Most Influential People in the World list, which is quite an honor. Um, we have some pictures of that. These are the fierce. pictures. She's looking fierce. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, you should see this uh, lovely picture they have of you mm -hmm. from your first year of Cornell, which is just a beautiful picture. Um, the inscription that accompanied your listing uh, was written by your colleague, Justice Scalia, who said this, I quote, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has had two distinguished legal careers, either one of which alone entitle her to be one of times 100. One, of course, is your career as a judge, first on the DC Circuit, and then now, of course, on the Supreme Court. And the other is your earlier career as a professor and a lawyer. And so I guess I'd, I'll ask you, um, what did you learn from your experience as a lawyer that best prepared you for your role as a judge? The importance of having a sense of humor. <laughs> uh, and then some advice that I've told many audiences, it was the advice that my mother-in-law gave to me on our wedding day. Marty and I were married in, his, in the home in which he had grown up. And his mother said, dear, I'd like to tell you the secret of a happy marriage. And that is, it helps sometimes to be a little hard of hearing. <laughs> <laughs> and I found that such good advice <laughs> not, not simply in dealing with Marty, who was a very funny fellow, um, but in dealing with my colleagues. Even. <laughs> um, so, President Clinton um, nominated you for the Supreme Court in uh, June of 1993 to fill the seat that was vacated by Justice Byron White. Um, some pictures of that. And uh, you were confirmed by the Senate uh, exactly 57 days later on August 10th, 1993 by a vote of 96 to three. Must have been nice. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying. Anyway, um, <laughs> other than the happy outcome, what do you consider the most memorable part of, of your confirmation process? The bipartisan spirit that existed in that Congress. Probably my biggest supporter was Orrin Hatch. My biggest problem, well, the White House handlers preparing me for the confirmation process, they would put questions like, you were on the ACLU board in the year so-and-so, and that year they passed Resolution X. How do you vote, how did you vote, and would you defend that position today? And my answer was, stop. There is nothing that you can do to persuade me to badmouth the ACLU. I think they are a vital institution in our society. And then, I mean, it, it could never happen today, but not a single question was raised about my ACLU connection. Justice Breyer was similarly fortunate the next year. Now, how, how do we get back to that? Um, I don't know what, what the magic will be. The, I was the beneficiary of what had happened in the Clarence Thomas nomination. So the committee was embarrassed. They had no women for the Thomas nomination, so they added two for mine. 
and they had a meeting with the committee before the public hearing. It was supposed to be that if there's anything bad in my record, they could bring it out and I'd have a chance to answer before we went public. In all of my record, nothing in the FBI file, there wasn't one thing questionable. Um, so they said, now tell us what you think we should do to improve the confirmation process. Well, at that point, I hadn't yet been confirmed, so I was uh, somewhat hesitant. <laughs> <laughs> I still have to this day um, a supply of Strom Thurmond keychains that, <laughs> that he gave me. He had voted against me when I was nominated for the D.C. Circuit, but he was in my corner for the, for the Supreme Court nomination. Um. <clears throat> so since being on the bench in, on the U.S. Supreme Court, you've been a very vigorous voice on a whole range of equal protection cases, not only uh, sex discrimination, but um, in the uh, racial discrimination area, in uh, disability cases. Um, most uh, recently in the Shelby County case, you uh, penned a very lively dissent um, about the uh, Voting Rights Act. I want to stop and, and ask you, um, you've at times compared the interesting progress that's been made so rapidly on questions of discrimination based on sexual orientation, contrasting that with um, our more uh, enduring difficulties with racial inequality. Um, what do you think explains the uh, difference in the in how sticky the issue of racial inequality has been. I think that when um, gay people began to stand up and say, "This is who I am," when that happened, people looked around, and it was my next door neighbor, of whom I was very fond, my child's best friend, even my child. They were people who belonged to our community. It wasn't, I mean, still today, uh, there is a high degree of segregation in living patterns in the United States, in schools. So I think it's, it's the difference that there's this we, they picture when it comes to race. But for gay people, once we find out that they are people we know and we love and we respect and they are part of us, I think that's what accounts for the difference. As during the years when gay people hid who they were, there was a, a kind of um, discrimination that began to break down very rapidly once they no longer hid in a corner or in a closet. Can you tell us a little bit about what went into your uh, thinking process on the voting rights case? Um, that was a uh, much uh, quoted dissent. Um, uh, your famous line about throwing an umbe umbrella away in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your thinking process uh, in that case. Well, it, it, it was very much uh, the, the view that I had of a, of a school segregation case some years before. I think it was Jenkins was, it was about Jefferson County, Kentucky, that for years and years had been under a federal court decree to desegregate. And then the court said, now the, the, the county is up to speed. They don't have to be under the thumb of a federal judge anymore. So I, I'm going to dissolve the injunction. The people in that county said, we liked the plan that was kept in place by the injunction. We would like to keep it. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't because that's deliberate discrimination on the basis of race. 
in the Shelby County case, it was one of the most successful pieces of legislation Congress ever passed. And it passed by overwhelming majorities on both sides of the aisle. You know, the, the Voting Rights Act, I think most of you know, worked this way. If you had had a bad record of keeping people from voting, then any change you made in the system had to be pre-cleared either by a three-judge district court in the District of Columbia or by the Attorney General. There was a mechanism to get out. If you showed you had a clean record for X number of years, you could bail out. And the court had held you could bail out on a county-by-county -county basis. You didn't have to wait till the, the whole state was up to speed. So they had a built-in mechanism for getting out. The Supreme Court held that the coverage formula was outdated, that from 65 till the 2000s, things had changed, so Congress had to redo the formula. But practically, what senator or what representative is going to stand up and say, my state or my county still discriminates? That was impossible. It was impossible to come up with a, a new formula for that reason. And yet, there was the bailout mechanism that would work when there had been a genuine change. And politically, it wasn't impossible to do the kind of revision that was needed. And so this most successful piece of legislation is largely inoperative. So you've written a number of uh, quite memorable dissents, in, in, especially in recent years. Um, I'll name a few of them. Uh, you uh, wrote a separate opinion in the Affordable Care Act case, the first one on the Commerce Clause. You wrote a um, very vigorous dissent in the Hobby Lobby case, and of course in Ledbetter as well, which Congress listened to and, and acted upon. Um, we've talked about Gonzalez versus Carhart. Um, the uh, partial birth abortion case, and then there have been Title VII cases like the Vance versus Ball State case about who's a supervisor under Title VII. Uh, so I think you may know that uh, Saturday Night Live uh, recently did a couple of skits about you um, on their weekend update. Um, there's a slide, slide nine, if you could show them. <laughs> and the comedian, uh, Kate McKinnon, plays you as a hip, sassy judge who's dishing out these feisty one-liners and then dancing after everyone. I'm not gonna ask you to dance for us, um, but feel free to bring it if you, if you, if you, if you've got it today. But what I really wanna ask is how, how do you go about writing your dissents uh, in terms of tone and style um, your tone is actually not sassy, um, it's respectful, uh, but it also makes a point. Um, how do you think about the right balance? Uh, we have a lot of colorful writing from the Supreme Court, which spans a broad range of styles. How do you uh, think about yours? As you know, Goodwin, when there's time, and I'm on the dissent side, I try to have the dissent drafted before I get the majority opinion. That way I don't get trapped into writing not so, not so. I tell the story affirmatively, and the biggest put down that I have for the court's opinion is to deal with it in footnotes. <laughs> yeah. But you will remember from your term clerking, for me it was quite a term, um, that was the year of Bush v. Gore. And all this t-shirt business began that year. There, there were t-shirts that said, I dissent. People were struck that I didn't say I respectfully dissent. But what they didn't notice is I never say respectfully dissent. <laughs> Think of my colleagues who have just criticized the court's opinion as being profoundly misguided. That's one from John Paul Stevens. Or from Scalia. This opinion is not to be taken seriously. <laughs> and then they have to say that, and you ended. You've shown no respect at all. And then, so I, I never use it respectfully. I, I will say either I dissent or more often, for the reasons stated, I would affirm the decision of the Court of Appeals 
or it came out the other way, reverse the decision. Um, so now, because of your seniority on the court, you have the assignment power, uh, both in majority opinions when you happen to be senior and then in dissenting opinions when you happen to be senior. What goes into your thought process uh, with respect to assignments? It's good we're not majorities yet. Uh, when, when we split 5-4, I generally make the assignment. So I've succeeded to the role that John Paul Stevens had when he worked clerking for me. I think there's kind of a consensus that in the case of the health care, the Commerce Clause portion, um, Hobby Lobby, Shelby County, that as the most senior person on the dissent side, I should write the dissent. And for the rest, I, I try to be as fair as I can to distribute them evenly. And there hasn't been much grumbling from my colleagues about about that. When you think about um, your two decades now on the Supreme Court, um, do you think there are things that you feel more sure-footed about today than you did um, when you first began? Well, when I was a, a new judge, I had been on the D.C. Circuit for 13 years. And so I wasn't too quiet. At my, the very first sitting in October, I asked a lot of questions at oral argument. My then chief, for whom I came to have great affection, uh, decided I had been a little smart aleck. So at the end of the sitting, instead of giving me what is traditional for the junior justice, that is an easy, one issue, unanimous decision, he gave me a most miserable ERISA case. <laughs> where the court divided six to three. I went to Justice O'Connor to complain. I said, he's not supposed to do this, is he? She said, Ruth, you just do it. Just do it. <laughs> and get your opinion in circulation before he makes the next set of assignments. Otherwise, you are likely to get uh, another dull case. <laughs> that, that was her attitude to, toward life. Whatever was put on her plate, she just did it. So that was the beginning of my relationship with the, with the old chief. And in that first year, it's interesting that you mentioned the supervisor case. In my first year on the bench, the question was, were nurses supervisors and therefore unable to organize under the, unable to unionize under the NLRB? Um, an LRA, and I said, of course, they are employees, not supervisors. But that was before people. I think that, and then coming around the other way, now um, it's very hard to be a supervisor under under the Vance decision. So you mentioned Justice O'Connor. You, you arrived, when you arrived at the court in 1993, um, you were only the second woman, of course, ever to serve on the highest court. Um, your colleague, uh, we could show slide 10, uh, Justice O'Connor was appointed by President Reagan uh, 12 years earlier. Um, so when you think back to that time um, and your experience now for, for 22 years, um, working with a very wide range of colleagues, what do you think you've learned about the art of persuasion? Um, is it possible to persuade one's colleagues? And if so, how? <laughs> I'm really interested. Possible. <laughs> Impossible, yes. Uh, is it something that happens often? No. <laughs> I can remember a, a one dissent that John Paul Stevens assigned to me. The dissent came around. The, the vote at conference was seven to two. The opinion came out six to three, but the two had swelled to six. Now that was some heady experience, the, turning a dissent into uh, a comfortable majority opinion. We're trying to persuade each other all the time. So if a conference vote is one way, you try to write your position as persuasively as you can and hope you'll be able to peel off one 
or another vote. But most of the time that doesn't happen. Do we try? Yes, we do. And I could say that uh, with assurance up to this very term when people, when we're closely divided and the author of the majority or of the dissent is trying to pick up one more, one more vote. In your experience, um, how does that persuasion happen? Is it um, on paper or in person or, or how do the justices, uh, inter is, apart from sitting around the conference table, which happens after argument? It, it, it is largely on paper. It is read my dissent, read it carefully. You should be persuaded by it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, as you know, there's no vote trading at all. There's no, if you side with me in this case, I'll side with you. That never, that never happens. So we've mentioned uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist a couple times. Um, it's well known you, you have a very warm relationship with Justice Scalia as, as kind of uh, an interesting polar opposite. But, um, but it's perhaps less well known that you also had a very warm relationship with Chief Justice Rehnquist, who, uh, among other things, uh, took the meaningful step of assigning you the VMI decision uh, and eventually himself wrote the majority decision in the Hibbs case, uh, upholding the family leave provision of the FMLA. Um, can you describe a little bit about your relationship with Chief Justice Rehnquist? How did the two of you have such good chemistry? I'd say it was cool at first, but it began to improve when Sandra and I were talking about what to do about the ladies' dining room. This, the court is a very traditional institution, so there was the ladies' dining room. And we came to him with a proposal. We said, we'd like to rename it the Natalie Cornell Rehnquist Dining Room. The, the chief had a very happy marriage. His wife sadly died. And he, he well, he couldn't resist that it would be <laughs> the Natalie Cornell Rehnquist dining room. He had seen her suffering from cancer. The year that I had my first bout with cancer, he could not have been more supportive. He, the, the, after the surgery, he called me into his chambers. He said, Ruth, I'll give you something light for this assignment. I said, no, Chief, not this one. I'm OK now. Wait till the chemotherapy and radiation start. Then I'd like to be kept light. So he said, which case do you want? There I had my pick from, so I told him which one. And then he said, that's the one I was going to sign to myself. <laughs> but he assigned it to me. Then and I watched his relationship with his granddaughters when his daughter Janet had been divorced. And he was kind of a substitute father to those girls. He want, wanted them to, to keep in tune with their Swedish heritage, so he'd take them to the Lucia Fest at the, at the Swedish ambassador's residence. And they loved him dearly. That was the side of him a lot of people didn't see. So I consider VMI as the chief in mid-passage. Then he gets to the Family Medical Leave Act. I brought home that decision, and Marty said, Ruth, did you write this? <laughs> But it was, it was the chief. So as long as one lives, one can learn. So when you when you think back um, across these uh, couple decades, what do you think have been the biggest changes um, at, you've seen in the court? Uh, whether it's public perceptions of the court, uh, the lawyers who appear before you, or the the nature of the docket. Um, what what do you think are the biggest transformations? public is down on anything that has anything to do with government. So the Supreme Court has slipped, but not nearly as much as, as, Congress, as Congress has. That's, uh, that's the, a safe statement. The, 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 <laughs> the big change in, in the court's composition came not when we had a new chief, but when Justice O'Connor left us. And I have said many times, that the year that she left, 
every time I was in four, um, among four rather than five, I would have been five instead of four if she had remained with us. So she was a big loss in, in many ways. Let me ask you uh, another sort of big picture question uh, about your approach to, to judging. Um, I think many observers, uh, and, and we're now seeing some books being written about your corpus of work, um, many people have described your approach to judging as um, incrementalist. Uh, and indeed, at your, at your confirmation hearing, here's what you said. Isn't it terrible? People quote your confirmation hearing back to you. Um, <laughs> In your case, it's, it's, very, very, um, it's very good. You said, my approach, this is you, is neither liberal nor conservative. Rather, it is rooted in the place of the judiciary, of judges, in our democratic society. So in other occasions, you've spoken out against judicial activism, noting that the current court is one of the most activist in history. If you just measure it in terms of willingness to overturn legislation, um, you've written long, long ago that uh, Roe versus Wade uh, perhaps went too far too fast uh, in contrast to the step-by-step -step approach that characterized uh, much of your litigation approach as a lawyer. Um, so I guess I want to ask, have, have your views about gradualism changed at all in the course of your two decades on the Supreme Court? Or has it reinforced your sense that gradualism is the right approach? I don't know if I would use the word gradualism. Um, I, I do think it's healthy for our system if the court and the Congress can be in dialogue. And I can think of some great examples of that. When the court in the 70s said discrimination on the basis of pregnancy is not discrimination on the basis of sex, there was a coalition formed to pass the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. Uh, people from all parts of the political spectrum were on board for that. And that was repeated again with Lily Ledbetter. So if it's a question of statutory interpretation, there's a health, there can be a healthy back and forth between the, the, the Supreme Court and the political branches. Um, the, let me put it this way. The, the court is not in a popularity contest, and it should never be influenced by today's headlines, by the weather of today. But as Paul Freund said, inevitably, it will be affected by the climate of the era. I think that's part of the explanation of why the gay rights movement has advanced to where it is today, the climate of the era. Um, the court is really out in front. I mean, even in Brown v. Board, which everyone thinks of the big social change, well, it was a brief by the U.S. By the United, on behalf of the United States in that case, it said essentially, we were fighting a war against odious racism. And in that war until the very end, our troops were rigidly segregated by race. A huge embarrassment. And now the Soviet Union is pointing to the United States, this apartheid racist society. It's a constant embarrassment it's time for forced segregation of the races in schools to end. That was the position that the United States government was taking, made it easier for the justices. And yet it took them 13 years from Brown v. Board until Loving Virginia to, to declare miscegenation laws unconstitutional. They had lots of opportunities, but they waited uh, until the, the climate of the era had, had largely changed. So this, the court can be important in reinforcing a social change, and it can hold it back as well, but it doesn't initiate 
change. Do you think that's in some tension with the um, conventional understanding of the court as a counter-majoritarian institution? That it is supposed, that the role of the court is supposed to be counter-majoritarian, um, and yet uh, some people would argue that it's unrealistic to expect the court to be at the forefront, even when individual rights are what are at stake. It should be um, counter-majoritarianism. When, when our Constitution has a Bill of Rights that says these are the rules that Congress has to abide by, by. so the court should be vigorous in enforcing the, the rights um, in the Bill of Rights and in the 14th Amendment. The court is the guardian. The Constitution makes the court the guardian of those rights. So yes, the court must be vigilant, but we can't do what, um, say, a, a political party can do. Here's our platform. This year we're going to try to get through this and that. We have to wait till that it has to start with the people. I and mean, if it doesn't start with the people, it's not going to get to the court. So you have to have a concerned citizenry to press for these rights. Let me um, take us out of the law for a second um, and um, ask you, uh, as our time uh, runs out here, um, who are your most important mentors in your life? When people ask me who, what women were my role models, they, I say that in my growing up years, too, one was real and one was fictional. The real one was Amelia Earhart, and the fictional one was Nancy Drew. <laughs> <laughs> but I never had, in, in my college years, certainly law school, never had a, a woman teacher. People ask me, did you always want to be a Supreme Court justice? <laughs> I wanted to get a job in the law. <laughs> that's, that, was, that was my goal. And, and women weren't on the bench in numbers, on the federal bench, until Jimmy Carter became president. He deserves tremendous credit for that. He was in office only four years. He took a look at the federal judiciary and said, you know, they, they all kind of look like me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not how the great United States looks. So he was determined to appoint members of minority groups and women in numbers, not as one-at-a-time curiosities. So he appointed um, at least 25 women to federal district courts, and I was one of the lucky 11 appointed to a court of appeals during his time. And he said in October of 1980, when he had a reception for the women he had appointed to the federal bench, that even though he had no Supreme Court vacancy to fill, he hoped he would be remembered for how he changed the complexion of the U.S. judiciary. And no president went back to old ways. President Reagan, not to be outdone, was determined to put the first woman on the Supreme Court. What, um, as you reflect on the entirety of your life and career, um, what do you think, um, what aspects or events have given you the greatest personal satisfaction? I was tremendously fortunate to be born when I was, to be a lawyer with the skill in the 70s to help move that um, progress in society along. If I had been born in it even 10 years earlier, it would have been impossible. In, in the Turning Point brief, in the Read You Read case, we put on the cover of that brief the names of two women. Paulie Murray was one, and um, was the other one I already mentioned her, the, the one who was concerned with putting women on juries. Uh, all over, all over the country. Um, we put their names on the brief to say they kept the message alive even when people were not prepared to listen. And we owe them 
a tremendous debt. How lucky we are. I mean, just think of the, the quote, conservative burger court, the first case, read, 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 comes out unanimous judgment. And most of the others came out the right way in the 70s. So I, I count myself enormously fortunate to be around when it was possible to move society to the place where it should be for the benefit of all of us. We mean, everyone is the beneficiary of ending gender discrimination. Women, men, like Charles E. Morris, and children. I mean, that's how the old chief was per persuaded when he was Justice Rehnquist. In the Weisenfeld case, this was a story of a man whose wife died in childbirth. He was left the sole caretaker of the child, wanted social security benefits that would help him be able to work only part-time while his child was young. Those benefits were for mothers, not fathers. So the court um, decided that case, I think it was in 1975. It was a unanimous judgment, three sets of opinions. One, well, of course, the discrimination against the woman as wage earner. Her Social Security taxes don't get for her family the same protection. And then a few of them thought it was really discrimination against the male as parent. He would not have the opportunity to render personal care to his child. And then Rehnquist, all alone, said, totally arbitrary from the point of view of the baby. Why should the baby have the chance to be cared for by a parent, only if the parent is female and not not male, but it was, it's that realization that we will all be better off if we end the, the discrimination, if we end the era of women off of the home and children and men off of the outside world. Both should be in both worlds. Before we go, um, let me say on behalf of everyone here, I think we are all enormously fortunate that you've lived the life that you have um, and been such a tremendous inspiration to so many generations, and we look forward to what's still to come. Thank you so much.